and we are recording. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. I just getting things set up here. Um, but I know the first on the agenda is to review um, the minutes, um, which I believe Jesse took for us last time. So thank you, Jesse. And who is next on the list? I think it is Steve, actually. Steve no, Steve did it. Steve did it before Jesse. So it's uh, in order. Yeah, but uh, Jesse was off one time, so Steve took over. I think it's Stella if she's ready. <laughs> I think so. It's, it's free. <laughs> I can just do it in like a Word document and then send it to Stephanie, right? Yeah. It, it works very well if you take the, the Word doc that Stephanie sent for the last minutes and use it as like a little template. That's exactly what I was going to do. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the... The, the obvious advice. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm great at. <laughs> Okay, great. Has everybody had um, a chance to review the minutes? All right, I see nodding heads. So are there any comments or edits? I have a question. Under section 4D, there's an acronym, IAQ. I didn't recollect what IAQ. Is that one of yours, Jesse? That's probably me in, in indoor air quality. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. I can type that out. Otherwise, I thought the minutes looked great, so I would move to accept the minutes. Um, I, I just have one question before you do. <laughs> I, um, um, let's see, um, number seven. Um, you didn't have an action, like who was going to um, communicate our, our decision. And I wonder if you did get communicated. Oh, yeah, that was because um, I think it was Jesse. But I can't remember if that was in the motion or if just you all voted to do that and then kind of volunteered Jesse after. I don't know that it was part of the official motion. It, it was done. If, if that's helpful, we could <laughs> that's, retroactively that's say, <laughs> you could retroactively say in there that I would, <laughs> I would do it and FYI, I subsequently did do it. Okay. <laughs> Great. My only thing. So now I second Steve's motion. Hey, so voice vote. Goldner. A. D. Uh, I'll abstain because I was absent last time. Elman. Yes. Rose. Yes. Bregavan. Yes. Drucker. Yes. Breger. Yes. Roof. Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, great. Um, so next up is public comment. Do we have any public members here today? We have Anna. Anna, do you have a comment? Anna, as always, feel free to raise your hand if you have anything to add. Um, but okay, great. So we can move, keep moving forward here. Um, staff updates. So Dave Zomek and I spent a couple of weeks going out to the abutters of the South Landfill, uh, meeting with each one uh, to talk about the fencing that's going up for the conservation restriction that's associated with the solar landfill development. So that's all part of it. Um, so we met with each and every one. Um, 
uh, so the fencing, that final strip of fencing will be going in probably in the next week or so, if not by the end of this week, certainly I would think by next week. Um, the project is all completed. The only thing is the commercial operation date uh, is being a bit delayed because of Eversource. So um, unfortunately it looks like that may not happen when it was supposed to. So we're kind of just negotiating uh, that extension. So the commercial operation dates being a bit pushed back. Um, really exciting news, the MOU between the three communities to move forward with the CCA uh, contract with a consultant has finally been signed. And so that's fully executed. We are officially now the Valley Green Energy Working Group is what I called us. <laughs> so. Um, we're meeting for the first time as an official group on Friday, and that's been posted, so uh, that's exciting. And the draft contract uh, for the consultant is being reviewed by the town before we, um, by town legal, just to make sure that there are maybe some updates needed now that we have an MOU versus the town of Amherst and the other two communities working sort of together versus an official MOU. Um, so that's going to be reviewed and hopefully should be out sooner than later to move that effort forward. That's exciting. Um, we had interviews today for the resident positions on the solar bylaw working group. Uh, the town manager will be announcing those at an upcoming town council meeting. We anticipate that means those meetings will expect to convene probably um, just after July 4th. Uh, is probably going to be the timing because they still have to be officially vetted and I think by the time we get the committee together it's probably going to be realistically July 4th because people are going to be on vacation so which is my next thing um, it would be great if you all would send me your vacation dates for the summer like from now to probably through September if you take vacations in September um, I actually will be taking one this year in September so if you can get me all your vacation dates, I'll try to get them on a calendar so we can see which dates we may not have a quorum for summer meetings. Uh, let's see what else. The Cadmus Solar Project assessment on the you know specific buildings and sites for solar development, like the parking lots and a few town buildings, is pretty much wrap, wrapping up. We're going to be expecting a first draft soon. Um, that's project is supposed to be completed by June 15th, so I'm hoping that we get the draft, if not by the end of this week, then certainly the beginning of next week. Um, and that final report will be available by the 15th, I would think. And that's what I have so far. Stephanie, will we be able to see the draft when it comes out before it's finalized? Yeah, but that's just, yeah, I mean, it's mostly just a solar, I mean, it's a really basic level analysis for a few town buildings and I in the parking lots. Um, and that's going to feed into the other solar assessment. Um, I don't think there's anything that's going to be earth shattering coming from that particular assessment, because one of the buildings that they looked at was the police station. You know, we sort of already know where that's going to go. It's um, the thing that they were also looking at, though, is battery storage. So um, there may be some guidance on battery storage, like at the police station, um, uh, you know, kind of as an, like a, a standalone. Um, so we will certainly, I will certainly share it with you. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff, even if it's not yeah. earth shattering. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm more than happy to share it. I absolutely will. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, how much will change in the draft from the final, but yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to send you the draft. Great. Any other questions for Stephanie? Yeah, Andra. Um, might have just missed this. Um, I wondered if the... Um, um, the, there's any movement to hiring the consultant who will be uh, assisting the solar um, bylaw group. So I, right, so there's no, 
there's there's a solar assessment and there's a consultant that's being hired for a solar assessment and the town is starting to work on um, looking at that process and developing the scope of work. I've been in contact with Dwayne earlier today. Um, we're trying to de determine whether we should do a, a formal RFP or if we should just do a request for quotes, which means we work off the consultants that the state has vetted. So it's a very specific list that we would have to adhere to. So I'm asking Dwayne to take a look at the list. Happy to share it with you all as well, if you all know consultants on that list. Um, that process would go faster. So it kind of limits us to the consultants that have been vetted through the state, but it also is a faster process than if we do a formal RFP, which could take at least two months from um, posting the proposal to, or you know, posting the notice to actually executing a contract could easily take a couple of months. Um, so the RFQ process would be a bit faster. So there's that. So we're discussing that. Um, and that's kind of where that, that stands. As far as the, the consultant for the solar bylaw working group, I don't know that there is going to be one for that process. So right now, as far as I'm aware, because I don't know if there was actually funding for that, but we have the funding for the consultant for the assessment. So, and sorry, I meant to include that. So thanks, Sandra. Okay, great. Any other questions for Stephanie? Our, our attendee has their hand up. Oh. Okay, Anna, you're unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, Stephanie's right. The only thing is it's in the proposed budget. So if it passes, there might be funding for, uh, it's through, Chris applied for it through planning um, for the bylaw, but it's there isn't money currently. It's just, it's proposed. So stand by, I guess, is the, the best answer there. <laughs> Um, because I do remember it being in the budget, in the proposed budget. That's all. And hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, sorry, I have an itchy nose with the pollen. Um, okay. ECAC member updates. Well, I guess, Anna, while you're on, do you have any updates from the council side that you want to share before we switch to ECAC member updates? Sure. So a um, couple of things that are on my radar um, stemming out of budget season that I'm hoping to work with you all on. Um, one is just to, you know, make sure that we're getting all of this, the information we need from um, inventory and that we know what to do with that information once we get it. So when we look at our buildings and we look at our vehicles, um, I know that Stephanie gets, um, gets a, I think it's a separate, is that right, Stephanie, a separate inventory um, or something, but uh, we want to just make sure that we're capturing everything we need to be on track to hit some of those goals. Um, so just as an FYI, that's something I'm hoping to bring to you all uh, as an idea that you might choose to pick up or not um, of what else might be in an inventory um, of our capital uh, assets, I guess is the term. So vehicles, buildings, et cetera. Um, and where do we need to go with that? Um, council is looking, uh, things that are coming up on our radar. We are looking at approving finally the flood maps. Um, and we also are going to be looking at the demolition delay bylaw and um, historic preservation bylaw. So uh, keep an eye out for those. They're on the agendas, uh, the next couple agendas. So the historic uh, demolition delay um, is one that I had flagged as potentially having some uh, implications for, for climate action. Um, I don't know, Laura, if they have worked with you all at all with, on that one in particular, um, but it's that, that's coming down the pike in terms of um, what are our rules for how long people need to wait before they can demolish or significantly modify historic buildings. Um, other than that, I know that you all have been working, I think Steve and I can't remember, I have been working with Andra, um, Steve and Andra have been working with Mandy, there we go, um, on the rental registration bylaw and that is that is moving forward as well. So those are the things that I flagged as potentially having um, implications. And then just zooming out, I know that's something I'm hoping 
um, we can keep a focus on is how you want to um, how you want to be consulted. And, you know, I'm always happy for feedback on what you want to hear from me in these meetings, what would be helpful. Uh, so please always feel free to reach out or go through Laura, whatever works better for you. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I don't think we've been connect. I, I, I haven't been connected with anyone about the demolition delay by law, uh, stuff, but good to know and happy Maybe yes. Anna, if you if you know more specifics about when it's going to be on the agenda, mm -hmm. um, if you could let us know, we can maybe just let people know that if they want to make a public comment about it, they can. Yeah, I believe it's on for uh, shoot either the sixth or the thirteenth. Um, but in addition to public comment, I mean, not for nothing. Like I'm I'm here as a liaison, so you can make public comment, and that's great. But if you also have things like questions you want me to ask or things you would like me to, to bring forward as well. Um, in addition, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So public comment, you can just say things. I can actually ask questions. So if you have questions, um, funnel them, funnel them to me, or you can ask the sponsors directly, but I'm happy to, I mean, in my mind, my role as liaison is also advocate. So please, um, yeah, let me know what you want to see or what's missing or what shouldn't be there. Okay. And what yeah. was the date again? Sorry, I missed that. I'm going to check. I'm going to check right now, Laura, and I can okay. email you. But I think it's either the 6th or the 13th. Okay. Yep. So regardless, it's not going to be, we're not going to have another ECAC meeting before then. Um, well, it, but there's two readings. Um, sorry, okay. I should have clarified that. There's two readings because it's a bylaw. So um, we'll have it. It'll be on the agenda twice. Okay. So that's good. To, yeah, Lori. Yeah, so if, if it's six and 13th, we won't have another, um, or is it every other, how often are council meetings? The first and last uh, Monday of the month. Okay, so, so we will have we will have uh, one then. But I, I do think that- or First and third, I'm sorry, Laurie, first and third. I swear I know what I'm doing. All right, mm -hmm. so I, I think I think the thing to communicate is just that, that you know, the, the council should be considering energy transition considerations in making these rules. I don't know if there are specific things we could ask for, but certainly. Yeah, so I agree with you, Lori. I think the thing is that we don't know what we don't know, right? And so often we can say we wanna consider all of uh, uh, the climate and uh, climate goals, but we don't know how. And so I think that's where um, I guess my my approach is kind of, I'm gonna try to flag things and 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 tell you and then whether it's individually using your expertise or as a group responding um getting your input on that because mm -hmm. I, I can look at this and with my you know my bachelor's in environmental science from too many years ago I can try but it's not going to be quite as good so um I think that's where we want to pull from your expertise and and I apologize I'll try to get these to you further in advance so you actually can look at them um as a group if that's what you want to do but truly I mean it, I think it's up to you how you want to engage, I'm just going to give you the heads up, and um, and you can decide from that point if that sounds good. I mean, I also can work differently if that's what you all decide, but I just want to make sure your input is is in here at some point. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to. No, of course, of course, and I, I think yeah, definitely try to get it to you all sooner. Um, it, I think it's the problem, Lori, is that it's not an atom, automatic consideration right now, and we want it to be, but it's too easy of a box to check if it's, yeah. okay, we thought about it for two seconds, right? Like, that's not actually doing it. So um, I think it's it's really a matter of what does it mean to check that box to say we've considered uh, our climate goals and, and energy and the environment in less of a broad way, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, Laura, I'm done talking. <laughs> okay, thanks, Anna. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if you want to send us the bylaw and the a, a date of the first read, then maybe we can talk about it at our next meeting um, if there's anything we want to put together. Um, okay, uh, ECAC member updates. I think, Steve, you were raising your hand before I diverted for a second. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, I do have an, well, two updates. The first is that the last couple of nights we've seen fireflies out in our backyard, which is um, marks the beginning of summer or one of the 
mark, so the beginning of summer. It does seem a little bit early. We all decided last night. We don't usually see them until a little bit later in June. Um, second update is that last week the um, council CRC met and discussed the suggestions that we, the ECAC, provided concerning the rental permit registration system. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the meeting uh, until the very end, just as they were finishing, but I did watch a recording of the meeting and Mandy Joe sent some questions that they all had concerning our suggestions. And so I have since worked up some answers to those questions. What I, what I realized was we kind of went in with our suggestions being quite specific without a broader context as to why do we wanna know about the age of a building or its kind of insulation or the heating system. And while we all knew it, we didn't convey to them that we are looking at various ways to try to improve the energy efficiency of, of rental units in town and that we actually have a pretty in-depth plan that's been developed over the past year or so. So what I've done is taken the questions that Mandy has um, presented and used that as a format to provide more context. And so I've got a document that I've written up that's about a page and a half um, answering those questions. I'll just read the questions and then if, if you guys wanna know more about my responses now, I can share that. But what I thought I would do is share this draft individually with members for feedback and the next CRC meeting is June 9th next week. Um, and I'd like to get a document to them well, maybe by Monday of next week so that it can go into the packet. They'll have a chance to look at it before their meeting. And then I will be able to attend the meeting to answer any additional questions that come up. Um, the questions that Mandy Joe relayed were to one, elaborate on the purpose for gathering the information re requested, including what is hoped to be gained from gathering the information and how the information would be used. Um, the second question is which of the items on the list are intended to be gathered for, gathered for use by the public versus use by town staff and committees only? And then third, what are best practices or just any practices that municipalities use for promoting and managing energy efficiency in rentals? And so in responding to that, I have just written out what we have done and mentioned, um, relied a fair bit on two reports that we have used. One is the American Council on Energy Efficiency Efficient Economy, or ACEEE, -E, and the other is the RMI report, Better Rentals, Better Cities. Both of those reports outline in great details, they provide roadmaps for how communities can increase um, energy efficiency in rental units. Um, the ACEEE -E -E, um, goes more into um, social equity and justice issues uh, in the Rocky Mountain. Our RMI report is a little bit more on a technical side, but both provide really good information. I've already provided those reports to Mandy and she's put them in the packet for the CRC to review. And what I've done is try to summarize the reasons for increasing energy efficiency in rental units, the, the concept of the split incentives, that building owners don't have an incentive to increase the efficiency when tenants are paying the energy bills. And then a little bit of background about what we've done, including the um, Power grant. And Stephanie, you can tell me whether we can say anything about it or if that's still under quarantine. Um, and just some of the ideas that we've developed in our committee. So for the sake of time, I think I'll leave it at that unless people have people here and now have questions, but I will send a document around for your um, comments. Great. Just a quick um, note, Steve, just call it the Mass CEC grant and then you're fine. So just don't reference Empower at all. Just say Mass CEC grant and you're okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think Steve, the only comment I would have is that in terms of like what's public or not, I mean, I think anything we would want to, I, I would say that anything we would want to analyze could potentially be public because if we share it with each other in a meeting, then it's going to be shared, you know, so um, that was my only thought on that point. 
Yeah, my answer on that one is fairly short. And I wrote that ECAC endorses the concept that energy efficiency ratings of rental units should be public information. Many of the other items on our list are already public information available on rental permits and property cards. However, deciding which information is public versus private is up to town officials. Great. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. Um, any other ECAC member updates? I can update on two things. Um, one is that Andra, Stephanie, and I met with Paul on Friday um, to kind of get an update from him on the implementation of the climate plan and goals and talk a bit about, you know, ECAC's role and how we can be most effective in supporting the town in, in helping to meet their goals. Um, we had a really good and frank discussion. Um, you know, I think one of the things that came across clearly is that, um, you know, I sort of spoke about the fact that we've been, we have been making progress just by the fact of having the CARP and um, Stephanie doing so much great work to um, involve her colleagues in the, both the development of the car, CARP and using the CARP to help prioritize. Um, but there's not really any concrete processes in, in place to, to, to make that happen. And so it's, ha you know, it's happening in spite of having a process that really forces, <laughs> forces that to happen for lack of a better word. Um, and so we talked a bit about that and, and you know, what changes we could make quote unquote for free that would just build in some processes for review to make sure when we talk about applying the climate and justice lens to everything we do, which are goals of the town, um, that we actually have processes in place that do that, um, provide that check and balance. So we had a good discussion about that. Um, we talked a bit about, you know, the role of ECAT, you know, and he had, to his credit, you know, looked at our, some of our result, like our outputs from our retreats and, you know, had had thought kind of been following what we've been doing and thought that, you know, our focus on education and outreach to residents, you know, is particularly of interest, given that, as we know, um, most of the emissions occur in, in our resident residential and commercial buildings and not in the town buildings. So we talked a bit about that, but also, you know, what are the, where are the processes within both the town government and the council where we can have other sort of touch points there. So we can provide educational outreach or partner with folks to provide educational outreach to residents. The town, the town could potentially add some step in the process of reviewing permitting for new heating systems and that kind of provides an opportunity for input into the process and you know obviously the long game is to have a um policy whether either at the state or the local level ideally state but that you know bans fossil fuels and new construction and you know helps to push for renovation of buildings over time. So um, we, you know, he, he also agreed that it would be helpful for ECAC to go through the CARP and really kind of identify some policies that we think the council should be acting on. Um, so I think that's an action item that we should, we should think about who might wanna take that up. Um, and we can, we can figure out um, how, how to move that forward because we do have quite a few counselors who ran on a platform of climate action and so I think to the extent that we hold them to that and you know identify things they should be acting on um, I think that could be could be helpful as well um, I'll pause before I go to my second thing I'll pause there to see first if Andre and Stephanie have anything to add and then if anybody has questions I would just add that um, we talked not just about the um, 
the role of ECAC in developing or suggesting policies for the council to adopt, um, but also um, to track and um, put forward resolutions um, about state policy that is needed in order for us to meet our goals in town. And, and to have that be expected and, and you know, something that um, the town manager could then sign on to letters as they come up um, based on council approval of, of support for various things. Great. Um, okay, so I think that, and then my other update is just that we are nearing the end of the governmental calendar year, <laughs> which means that we are due to vote for um, chair and vice chair. So I think assuming everyone will be joining our next meeting, I think we'll put that on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, I have very much enjoyed being chair of ECAC for three years, but I think it is time for some fresh blood to jump in and take the reins. I will still be on ECAC, but um, so that position is open. And if anybody has questions for me about chairing, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to answer them. Um, and final point is that I do have to leave a bit early today. So um, Andra will jump in and take over for me when I, when I have to step away. Um, any other ECAC member updates before we move on to our agenda? Okay, great. Um, so let's see here. Solar planning in Amherst. So Dwayne, I think I'll turn it over to you. All right, uh, thanks. Um, so I spent a little bit of time, um, not with any great, um, uh, outcomes, but um, uh, some analysis that I thought would be useful to bring to the committee um, for discussion uh, and, and sort of to sort of st with the objective of starting to think about how we might want to frame um, uh, both for ourselves and the community in terms of what uh, what amount of solar hosting would make sense uh, for the town of Amherst. Uh, and then also to eventually uh, incorporate that into the solar assessment work uh, to uh, use that consultant to help us um, identify uh, or, or sort of uh, establish sort of how uh, certain amounts of solar, uh, uh, solar megawatts, solar capacity might be hosted in the town. Um, so um, I did send around, or at least I, I sent to um, Stephanie and Laura, and then they sent around a, a short presentation um, that that uh, sort of summarizes the uh, analysis that I went through and would be keen on um, going through that quickly and getting some feedback and thoughts uh, in terms of um, where we, um, whether this makes sense to you all and where we might take it from there. Um, so I see um, that's up and going. Um, and um, so yeah, basically I looked at three things. Um, one is I just wanted to get a handle of uh, how much solar do we have currently uh, in Amherst, <clears throat> uh, which is this slide. Um, and uh, so what I did was um, went back to the, um, you know, DOER has a database of that, that anybody can get off their website of all of the projects that they've qualified through SREC program, SREC2 program, and now the SMART program and just sorted that uh, for the uh, 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 systems that were projects that were installed in Amherst, uh, and then divided that into three categories, uh, residential, um, uh, non-residential, uh, which I called CNI and, and ag, um, not to suggest it is necessarily ag, but it's basically non, as per DOER classifications, it's non-residential. Uh, and then, um, parsed out the what the projects that were um, hosted by the university and the colleges. Uh, and so these are the, uh, the these are the outcomes. Um, what it does show is that there's been 
steady as you, one would imagine uh, for small residential projects. Um, the cumulative capacity just grows sort of slowly over time. I would say similar to the state, it's kind of still going up, but it's going up less quickly than it was sort of in the uh, SREC 2 program. Um, but we do have um, uh, a total of seven, seven megawatts uh, installed uh, in um, <clears throat> residential projects in Amherst. <clears throat> and let me apologize, I have a cold. Um, I, I've gotten three at-home tests that have all been negative for COVID. Uh, so I think I'm good, but I, I do have, I think, a, <laughs> the old-fashioned cold. Um, in terms of seeing, uh, we're well, first focusing on the uh, universities uh, and, and colleges. Um, uh, and as you get to larger projects, these these cumulative lines tend to be a little bit uh, bumpier uh, as megawatts at a time are installed as opposed to uh, small kilowatts. Uh, and so there's been um, this increase over time with the, uh, the, the, the uh, Amherst College, Hampshire College project is one of these big bumps. Uh, and then the solar canopies and other projects at UMass are also the, these bumps here. But in total, we have about 12 megawatts installed across the university and the two colleges. Uh, and then um, non-residential projects in, in Amherst uh, are also amassing to the, the most, uh, 21 megawatts, with some caveats there. Um, one is that, uh, again, again, these are large-scale systems, so there's some, some uh, you know, uh, some growth of, of uh, and non incre small increments for smaller scale uh, CNI projects, but then you get these uh, big um, jumps every once in a while when megawatt scale projects are installed. Um, I will say that the two town projects that we're familiar with, um, the um, landfill project, which is um, is in this database, but uh, almost uh, commercially operating. That's, and I'm not sure. I'm not sharing the screen, so you can't see my cursor. But um, that's the um, the the, uh, 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 um, the 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 ramp up um, in uh, January uh, 22 is the uh, is the landfill project, and then the um, yet to be built, but um, but is um, approved by DOER. Um, for the SMART program is the last bump up there, which is substantial, about, uh, what is that, about seven megawatts um, for the um, uh, project at the, um, at the um, golf course, the Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Um, the, two other pro the two other large projects which occurred in, in 2019, um, uh, I'm, I'm still working with Stephanie to, um, there's two projects that have two different names. Uh, I believe they're I believe they're both in North Amherst. Um, one is the one that I know is built in in um, uh, on Cow's Land uh, in um, uh, North Amherst there. Uh, but then there's a second project, um, which I'm still trying to definitively um, figure out whether that project was built or not. Um, but um, but nonetheless, those are the two bumps, uh, two large bumps in uh, 2019. Um, so that amasses, uh, you know, assuming that uh, with after the Hickory Ridge project, um, we're about 21 megawatts on the uh, CNI. Uh, the pie chart here uh, just shows the cumulative amounts uh, of the uh, of the, these three types of solar. But if you go to the next slide, um, unless there's any questions on on that one. Um, this one I, I decided, and I think we sort of decided as a, as a committee that we're really going to um, really focus this assessment and analysis on the town of Amherst separate from the colleges and the university, um, given that uh, the two colleges and the university each have their own carbon plans going forward um, and uh, somewhat uh, obviously Hopefully, with some connections, but but really it, on separate tracks than the the town uh, itself. Uh, so I think when we, my thought is that when we set the goals or um, scenarios for the town in terms of how much hosting, uh, it would be best to do that um, separate and independent of what the university and the colleges are doing. So I basically just took that same data, took out the universities um, and 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 the colleges. 
um, and and the, this is the same data, but um, in two different forms. One, it's now you know, um, first of all, to note that that um, these projects, there's 850 solar projects that have been qualified in in Amherst. Uh, that's sizable. The large, huge majority of that are residential, uh, but three quarters of them are projects that are large. Um, and we see that in the left hand, which is the residential at, from the previous graph, <clears throat> the amounts that, that's um, residential per DOER qualification on their database and, and the, the three, three quarters that are CNI and AG per DOER's um, database. Um, but then I also, um, each of the projects also had how many um, kilowatts uh, DC uh, was installed. Uh, and so I just separated those out um, by size uh, as well. Uh, obviously, the residential ones are, are primarily this group that's zero to 25 kW. Uh, there's some uh, relatively few, but there's probably a few residential ones that are a little bit larger, but essentially that's all residential. Surprisingly to me, um, there were very few projects amounting to minimal capacity that were in these intermediate sort of commercial ranges of, um, you know, larger than residential, but up to 100 kW, or even up to 500 kW, uh, very small projects. I think to some extent that somewhat mirrored in the state itself, but I think more so in Amherst, um, because we probably have less um, large roof spaces, um, commercial scale, uh, commercial scale roof spaces to put up solar. Um, now this may change, for example, with the, the high school uh, type of building. Uh, those are, you know, one of the relatively few uh, scale buildings that we have in Amherst that might accommodate these larger scale systems on, on roofs. Uh, but nonetheless, um, again, the, the, you know, three quarters of the capacity is coming from projects that are over 500 kW. Um, and my guess is that you could count those all on uh, maybe not one hand, but two hand hands in terms of the, the number of projects. Um, all right, so that's where we stand in terms of uh, installed capacity as of um, uh, now, basically in, in, uh, in Amherst. What I then uh, wanted to look at is um, how much, uh, try to get a sense of how much um, uh, energy we use as a town uh, to give us at least some grounding for how much solar uh, we might want to host uh, in in Amherst, uh, and so these were the two. These were the um, databases I had, and we previously looked at this. Some um, some of you um, who are newer to ECAC uh, may not have gone through this as much as we did at the beginning, but looking at <clears throat> um, the two prior uh, greenhouse gas inventories, there was one for 2011, one uh, more updated to 2017. That's the latest data we had. Um, and there, there was uh, data with regard to um, uh, electricity use, scope two, um, based on on scope two emissions, and it it had had a uh, some good tables um, in the spreadsheets behind the report um, that laid out how much electricity was being used, uh, broken down by the municip municipality itself, um, the community, um, which I well residential. And then there's this category of community, uh, which I think we decided was basically everything in the community except for residential and except for the municipal buildings. Uh, and then it listed separately also the um, university and the two colleges. Um, and so I looked at the data from 2011, I looked at the data from 2017 um, and um, the, the big, discrepancy here I think is really on the on we see a little bit of uh, uh, you know it's pretty steady on the municipal level maybe a little bit uh, reduction which is good and part of Stephanie's work um, recognizing the, the municipal services has probably grown over this time as well um, community the community the the CNI if you will in the town has seemed to gone up a bit um, this was all before COVID obviously um, and the residential has fallen off quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if that's just due to data issues with these two studies, um, 
which are not precise uh, and used uh, as, as some some methods that Stephanie might be able to help us with. But there was some uh, significant reduction in the um, electricity use in residential. I'm not sure if that's because of energy efficiency, because we've lost people, I don't know, <laughs> um, or because of some data issues. But nonetheless, um, we, we do see that cumulatively between, between uh, keeping the universities out of it, um, that um, you know, we roughly about 100,000 um, 100, megawatt hours per year uh, that we use in electricity. Um, I don't think this analysis needs to be overly precise. Um, and um, so then I sort of said, okay, let's, uh, to make assumptions for what we use as a, as a town um, currently, I said, okay, well, look at the data, I'll, I'll go somewhere in between, but closer to 2017, I said, okay, let's, let's uh, assume 95,000 megawatt hours. And then we also wanted to look at, okay, for 2050, uh, which is sort of the, the benchmark for the, you know, where, where we're, we're, we're trying to get to as a Commonwealth for carbon neutrality is essentially, as well as for the town. Um, Looking at the um, decarbon the the state decarbonization twenty fifty decarbonization roadmap, um, they um, and some of the the uh, uh, detailed um, reports that they have associated with that, um, they indicate that with the electrification expected in the heating sector in the transportation sector, that there will be a doubling. Uh, I didn't find any precise numbers on this. Uh, but looking at the charts uh, and reading the text, they said a, a bit more than doubling uh, of electricity demand uh, for the Commonwealth uh, between now um, and 2050. Um, and uh, so I said, okay, if, if uh, Amherst is similar to the Commonwealth in terms of electrifying our heating, electrifying a good part of our transportation, then we might expect doubling our electricity use to uh, 190,000 megawatt hours by 2050. All right, yeah. And can yeah. I just, um, I just have some questions. Um, uh, it's a little bit technical on, on units and the like, but I also don't understand the columns here. The, um, the top here says electricity load in Amherst, but then these are from greenhouse gas inventories. So do the numbers in those 2011 and 2017 columns, is that the total energy used or the total electricity used? Yeah, the, uh, well, those are the, um, yeah, the, the, the data source is from the 2011 and 2017 greenhouse gas inventory study, uh, but the, the, the data from those studies is actual data on, on uh, direct use of electricity. Electricity. Uh, so. Yeah, these are, these are not greenhouse gas emissions. These are elect uh, electricity consumption. Oh. Interesting. So I would have expected the electricity consumption to go. That's why you were puzzled about why would residential go down if people were converting, it should be going, the electricity usage should be going up. Yeah, I don't think there's been a lot of conversion between uh, through 2017. Um, maybe a few, a few, but I, I wouldn't, it would be uh, noise. Um, so I don't know, and, and I, I'm open to any other ideas. Yeah, un whether unfortunately, that, that would have been a time period where people were adding gas yeah of course right yeah oh, so yeah, yeah. gas is not included in here the the usage of gas and, and oil and stuff like that is not in here just like correct this is not household energy use this is this is well for residential it's how much they electricity okay um, they're they're consuming not not uh not gas or, or oil or not for heating and so forth okay and the only other question i have is i'm trying to compare in my head the megawatts of uh, power produced by these different solar installations in the previous slide with megawatt hour per year, and I'm getting a big headache. <laughs> yeah, well, that, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, good. I think, well, the headache might <laughs> come or go, but um, we, we sort of uh, translate that a little bit in the and maybe the next slide and the next one. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so um, th this one is basically just to, uh, you know, it, we can refer back to this, but just some, uh, but but importantly, some basic assumptions that I made in getting to the next slide, which is um, <clears throat> um, sort of answering the question of, of uh, you know, how much solar we might need or 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 care to have. Um, 
just a couple assumptions. Uh, I assumed a solar capacity factor, uh, uh, which means how much so how much how many megawatt hours you get from a megawatt of solar uh, in in Massachusetts climate <clears throat> um, is about thirteen percent. Um, the the uh, the total just because some of these numbers come into play in the next slide. The total solar capacity installed in Massachusetts as of now is about thirty uh, is about thirty two hundred megawatts. Uh, that's between the three uh, SREC, SREC two, and Smart. Um, the twenty now looking digging into the twenty fifty um, decarbonization roadmap for the state. They are and again as as Steve knows and others who may have looked at the roadmap. It's you know the, the roadmap is not a single road. <laughs> There's various different roads uh, to get to the same destination, um, and so um, of, of basically decarbonization, as particularly of our electricity grid by 2050. But uh, and they have a number, uh, maybe about five or seven <clears throat> uh, different um, scenarios that they cover. Uh, but the I'm not sure if they would even refer to as the base scenario, but the prime scenario that they're looking at um, assumes that by 2050, the solar the solar capacity that we would need uh, in Massachusetts uh, is about 2,300 megawatts, 23 gigawatts, as they say, 2,300 megawatts. So that's it, we 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 use that later. Um, and um, they also indicate that, um, you know, across the Commonwealth, uh, amongst the other renewables that we're going to need, offshore wind being the dominant one, but also um, large scale hydro and, and, uh, and some smaller renewables, that solar in 2050 would contribute about 27%, 27.5% of the renewable contribution. Um, they had another analysis, which I thought was helpful to, to um, keep in, in mind here, um, that because uh, they did do some a deeper dive into um, land use uh, issues associated with solar. Uh, and again, in their, um, and this is not in the roadmap, but in this energy pathways, which is a, a more detailed report on, particularly on the electricity sector of this roadmap. Um, they did some analysis and looked at okay for for with all, there, there's a bunch of residential solar uh, and rooftop solar solar but the for the amount that would be expected to be land land based um, that uh, there would be an expectation that it would require in 2050 for this installation uh, would require about 66,000 acres of land in Massachusetts. Now that comes with a decent error bar, uh, and it's also uh, just for this one pathway. Uh, other pathways, for example, if offshore wind does not is more, high, more constrained than what they assume, the amount of solar we need goes quite a bit up, uh, as well as the land use, uh, quite a bit more than this. But uh, and we can look at all those sensitivities if we want to, but at least the um, the, the road that seems to be the one they're trying to aim for most um, would suggest, and they sort of suggest, I think is more optimal, would suggest we need about 66,000 acres of land dedicated to ground mounted solar. So if I yeah. can just add something, I'm just doing a quick uh, Google search. It looks like that's about 1% of Massachusetts land. Well, it could be the, 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 um, um, which seems I not. Think, well, the, the land area is next. I also looked at, you know, uh, just from census data, not nothing to do with carbon or climate, uh, but just to put in perspective, Massachusetts is 7,800 square miles is our land area. I think I, I'm pretty sure that does not include water, um, but uh, is 7,800 square miles. The town of Amherst, um, and I did subtract out I think about two or three square miles, which encompasses, encompasses the university and the colleges. Um, the town is 22 and a half square miles or about 0.29% of the Commonwealth's land area. Um, I think that 
uh, just a quick actually I think I think that means we're almost an average size town because <laughs> uh, we're, we're there's 351 if you divide one over 351 it comes to be about that amount um, uh, and and looking at our population um, our, our population and again the, the town of Amherst population is always hard to define a bit but this is the census data which is about 39,000 people out of 7 million for the state that's um, that's uh, about a half a percent of the uh, of the Commonwealth's population. So those are just different uh, useful uh, assumptions or data that I used in the next slide, which then laid out um, how we might put our heads around uh, suggesting um, to uh, to constituents as well as our um, solar um, assessment. Uh, a consultant of what we might ask them to do in terms of how much solar we want to find, be able to uh, see, see what it looks like to host different amounts of solar in, 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 the, in the town. So the first thing here is um, if we wanted to host enough solar um, in, 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 uh, in, in the town to meet our own electricity loads and all of our electricity load, um again this is um uh, does not include the university and the colleges um then we would need to have um 83 megawatts installed uh in in uh, in the town as of now to meet our load our, our 95,000 megawatt hours load currently um and to meet our entire load once we double our electricity load in in uh, in 2050 we would need to host about 166 megawatts of solar that's um that's one way to look at it um um uh and sort of put puts things in in perspective a bit and laurie gets maybe to your earlier question about how many conversion of megawatt megawatt hours and megawatts um you know, as I mentioned before, I think last week, as well as in the last slide, um, we don't necessarily need, need, you know, if we wanted to pretend we're not, or want to suggest we're an island and we want to be self-sufficient and we don't really have any other renewable energy resources to draw from, then this would be uh, perhaps an appropriate scenario to look at. And maybe it is one we want to look at. Um, but again, um, we're going to, as a commonwealth we're moving forward with both offshore wind uh which doesn't take up anybody's land um except for small amounts when the cables come to shore um or large-scale hydro uh which doesn't take up any appreciable or any land in massachusetts <laughs> uh, most of this is in far north um canada uh so um and that's you know uh, um um that we're we're sort of anticipating tapping into those resources because they make economic sense and and climate sense um and they're good for the for the uh, commonwealth as a whole <clears throat> and uh, and would suggest that uh that could uh suggest that we don't need to host uh and generate all the electricity we need um ourselves uh within our with our within our own geography uh so other ways to look at it <clears throat> is um looking at um, our fair, you know, quote unquote, fair share of, uh, of um, solar uh, by e either by land area uh, or by population. So from the um, uh, previous slide, which you don't have to go back, back, back to, but, you know, currently um, there's, uh, what I say, there's like 3,200 megawatts of solar installed in Massachusetts. And if you were to say, okay, we should be hosting at least our fair share of that by land area, that would suggest we only needed seven, nine megawatts. Uh, and to that, to, to that extent, I think we can, and, and if it's by population, we need 18 megawatts. We currently have 28 megawatts installed in Massachusetts. So I think we can, um, suggest, this would suggest that um, we are doing, um, uh, I'm not sure about more than our fair share, but we're doing our fair share and some 
uh, with regard to currently hosting um, more solar than, than our fair share uh, in Amherst uh, at, at this point in time. Um, Dwayne, on... can, I, can I jump yeah, in Laura. there? Um, is, that, is that right though? Because I, I thought you said the capacity factor was 13%. And so by my calculation, our, 28 meg, our current 28 megawatts is only contributing 3.6 megawatts per hour, right? Or megawatt per year? Yeah, Dwayne, I had a similar question too. You know, on the first line, you talk about doubling from 83 to 166 megawatts, but can you go back one slide? So you talk about 2022 solar capacity is 3,100 and 2050, that's more than doubling. You're doubling every, more than doubling every 10 years. Oh, well, the solar capacity, yeah, our electricity, yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, F finish your question, Vasu, sorry. No, my question was, you know, here it says you're more than doubling every 10 years, and then on the next slide, you just double the 2022 number to 2050, when it should be doubling every 10 years, so it should be... Uh, rough mat 700 megawatts in 2050. Um, yeah, keep in mind we're, we're um, uh, the number the the we the Commonwealth needs a lot more solar and all the renewables. I mean, right now um, the renewables only account for maybe 20 percent, 15, 20 percent of our electricity need of our electricity consumption. Um, but that needs to go to 100% by 2050. Um, so in, in this slide that we're looking at now for the 2022 column for current, I'm saying that um, of the current 3,200, uh, the current 3,200 megawatts of solar that is installed in, in uh, across Massachusetts, um, if we were to install our fair our, our share of that based on our land area of that 3200 that's currently installed we would only be responsible or need to, to host nine megawatts in our town by 20 2050 that much more than doubles uh, because by 2050, we still need to host, you know, a small per our percentage by land area, which is, you know, 0.29% or whatever, uh, but it's of a much larger number of, um, of installed solar uh, uh, in Massachusetts of um, 23,000 23, megawatts of solar in Massachusetts that needs to find um, sites in Massachusetts by 2050. It seems like a really low number. Um, a really low number? Yeah. The 23, well, it's it's basically just 20, the, 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 the solar capacity in the Commonwealth is 23,000 megawatts times our fair share of land <laughs> area which is 0.29% gets you to the 66 or by population, which is 0.56% um, gets you to 128. One thing that's a little confusing is the 2022 numbers are not targets. It's not what we need, it's what we have. Yeah, it just, you know, are we carrying our weight up to this point? Right. Um, yeah, and keep in mind that the renewable energy, I, I forget what fraction of our renewable energy in 2050 is um, supposed to come from solar versus other renewable resources. You might by 2050? Said, by 2050, yeah. Isn't it For the third? Commonwealth? Yeah. It was third about 20, 20, uh, 27 and a half percent was anticipated from solar. From solar versus the others. Um, under yeah. under the under the um, primary pathway.
Yeah, Jesse. So the both the 2022 and the 2050 columns are theoretical. Neither of them reflect actual installment. And, and you've got three scenarios shown. But but they're all theoretical. None of none of the nothing on this. These are all if then numbers. Is that but we're already above the 2022 numbers for fair share, right? Well, depending on how we look at it. We're not, what what's our number? That was the first slide. It, well, we're at about um uh 28 megawatts installed in Amherst. Uh, not including the university and colleges. That being said, um, I'm still waiting to confirm there is about a, uh, probably a five megawatt project that I still need to confirm whether that was actually built or not. I guess, so, can you, could, wait, Dwayne, can you speak briefly to why, why our, and maybe you just explained this, why, why you think the fair share, share scenarios are so much less than the cover our own load scenario? Um, yes. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting one's more fair or, or, or not, but these are just the terms I, I, I put in here. But um, the, oh, yeah. the, the issue with the first one is, you know, if, if we were to install enough solar, to meet our own needs, um, then the question would come up: Well, um, um, do is that is that a right goal? Is that the correct goal? And maybe it is. These are value questions, not science questions. Uh, maybe that is that is what we want to shoot for. Uh, that being said, um, um, we are a Commonwealth, um, and we have great offshore wind resources, for example. Um, and if if every town said we're going to generate our own electricity um, within our own confines, then nobody would need offshore wind because uh, it's in, not in anybody's town. Um, and so, um, you know, but but maybe there's an argument to be said, okay, well, that offshore wind is really going to serve the population centers of Boston and South Shore and, and stuff like that. And we really need to generate um, most not all of our electricity our, ourselves and there's economic reasons why we might want to do that as well uh but um you know so i so that's these are different scenarios we can look at not necessarily value um as one's one's the right answer uh or, or not but yeah that, that, that would assume that you know um that we were generating all of our electricity and not participating in any of the offshore wind or large-scale hydro that would be available to the Commonwealth as well. I see Stella and then Lori. Yeah, can I try answering Jesse's question and you let me know if it doesn't make sense? I think, so the sufficient solar installed to meet own electricity needs, that's not theoretical as I understand it. That's based on current electricity needs um, in the town. And the fair share numbers are not based off total electric needs of the state. They're based off what the state, the state's current solar capacity is, and then what like the town's, um, the town's contribution to that current solar capacity, which is nowhere near what would be necessary to meet the state's electrical needs. Does that answer your question? Was that your question? Um, yeah, if, if, is that right? If that's right, then that certainly makes sense. If I, was that right? <laughs> well, uh, the first part was state the second part again about the fair share. So the fair share numbers are based off what currently exists as far as solar capacity at the state level, which isn't anywhere close to what the solar capacity that would be necessary to meet the state's actual electric needs. And yeah, so the these fair, are, yeah, for these 2020. Fair share numbers are derived from current state 
solar capacity? Yeah, for 2022, it's based on um, uh, what's the current total capacity, which is not theoretical. It's 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 known data of what's currently installed in across Massachusetts now, and the 2050 is the portion of what the state anticipates it will need by 2050 um, uh, to meet its carbonization decarbonization roadmap. And specifically, if I can add, that was from your previous slide, 27, taken on a projection of needing 27.5% of the energy coming from solar. And that's- Yeah, actually, actually, it, it, it's, it, I didn't actually use that data uh, uh, per se, uh, because what I used was, um, I just thought that was a useful uh, figure to have. We might use it later, uh, but it was basically, um, and I, they're probably connected, uh, but uh, basically just drew out the data from the uh, decarbonization report that stated that um, the expectation was that there was a need for 23 gigawatts, 23,000 megawatts of solar installed. Okay. All right. So Dwayne, um, so what this says right, right now is that we're a third of the, with our 28 megawatts, we're a third of the way there in terms of sufficient solar installed to meet our own electricity needs. Like that kind of blows my mind, it seems. Well, again, there's a caveat. I'm not sure about one fairly substantial project. So it could be anywhere between 20 and 28, but yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we have... Uh, and also the caveat that, you know, we're still waiting for the um, Hickory Ridge project, which I think will be the largest project in Amherst when it's built. Uh, we're awaiting that one to be built, um, which is, you know, seven megawatts out of this 28 as well. Uh, so um, with those caveats, yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, we're 28 megawatts installed. Um, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, uh, go, going towards, you know, either 66 or 128, I guess, depending on whether it's by land area or population, if that's. Um, I mean, I just have a clarifying point. So we're looking at just solar development in town, but not necessarily because you were talking about the town meeting the town's electricity needs, but the Hickory Ridge project the town isn't the off taker for that so it will be solar installed in Amherst but it's not going to be directly benefiting the town's energy use yeah I think I mean that's something we can talk about um, I think you know generally for solar all over Massachusetts it's um, well there you know it's feeding the grid uh, it, it's going into the grid um, and, you know, to, to, to meet our climate goals, we need, you know, the, the Commonwealth is looking for 23 gigawatts of solar to feed into the grid. Um, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, need that to be matched up to um, uh, uh, the rate payers, uh, in individual rate payers. Some of it, it, it's financed different ways and, uh, um, Designed different ways in terms of um, net metering, virtual net metering, off takers, and so forth. But um, and we can get to that. I mean, if we want to make more of a of, of an economic argument uh, in terms of uh, um, making use of this energy ourselves, um, then um, then that's a bit of a different different issue. But you know, right more this this looks at it more in terms of of um, the 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 either the opportunity or the burden. Uh, to host solar uh, in your town, uh, just physically hosting it, um, regardless of, of where the, uh, you know, en energy, whether it goes to any individual people. Yeah, that was just the clarification. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, a good point. Okay. All right, everybody. I'm, I see Jesse and Lori have their hand up. I have to run, so I'm going to hand it over to um, Andra to chair us for the rest of the meeting. So I'll see you all later. Thanks, Laura. Um, just so you know, I'm on my phone, so I cannot see people's hands. So um, I can just call on people if you want. So yeah. I think um, Jesse was first, I believe. And then Lori. 
Sure. Um, quick, just first, I know we just jumped in and started saying, what about this number? What about that number? I just want to thank Dwayne for putting this all together. It's fantastic. And it, it is, and it's sort of the answer to the first question uh, that Steve was asked before, why do you need, why are you doing this? And we really can't do any of this work without understanding the existing conditions, without putting something on paper to react to. So I think this is a great example of why we gather data and put data in front of ourselves. So thank you for doing that so we can have this conversation, Dwayne. It's awesome. My second, I guess the thing I'm to still don't totally understand is why isn't the 83 kind of roughly three times the other numbers, but that might not be important. And then the final comment would be, just wanna plant the seed into all of our heads of how we might digest this information and make it um, uh, user-friendly in, in some way. Um, how we might tell this story slightly differently that that's that's more um, that might land with a broader audience than this group. So, yeah. Again, thank you, Dwayne. Yep, and I, I I'm very keen on on um, working together on that messaging. I think there's two outcomes that we need to think about. One is uh, to the extent that we are able to um, um, define a number of different scenarios that we might ask the solar consultants to um, look at uh, with regard to um, how much solar hosting we would want to be able to uh, uh, um, accomplish and what would that look like uh, or various ways that that might look like in, in Amherst. Uh, and the second is is uh, a more public facing um, uh, messaging of, of um, what we've learned from this data collection. Laurie had her hand up next. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I also wanted to thank Dwayne. This is fantastic. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that in the constant drumbeat of horrible climate and uh, planetary news on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, um, this sort of thing actually gives me a little bit of hope. I mean, we're actually I'm surprised we're doing as well as we are. And I'm glad I'm surprised. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? It's, it's, uh, there's work to be done, but we're on our way. And it seems to me that the bigger issue that we have to deal with and the harder one is that transition away from greenhouse gases. And perhaps that's maybe um, you know, something to keep in mind that we seem to be on our way on the solar front here. And uh, I, I really think that's great. We're, we're making progress. That's a good thing. And Steve has his hand up. Dwayne, do we know what of, of the solar that's installed in Amherst, do we know the acreage of that? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously the residential, all the re residential and small scale, it probably doesn't really have acreage associated with it. Um, the other ones, you know, as I mentioned before, the three quarters of the capacity is probably made up of um, a handful or maybe two handfuls of, of actual projects. Um, and those, I don't know. I mean, that's not part of the DOER database of, of solar projects, uh, but I suspect um there may be da data on that from the that the town might have access to. The town would have that data, Steve. Yeah. The larger ones. I don't again, not the residential probably, but definitely the large, larger ones. That would be awesome. Yeah. To fill in. I've heard issues raised with those sort of land used by solar farms uh, estimates, and there's different ways of measuring the land used. One is the area covered by panels, which is a smaller area the other another number is the area inside of the fence that's a bigger area than just the solar panels and a third measure sometimes people point to is the area sort of cleared for the solar farm which could be even larger than the fence uh, the fence line 
So there's different ways of counting the area. Um, I know at Hampshire College, our array that's in Amherst, the one that's across from Atkins Farm off of Bay Road there, that's 2.3 megawatts and it's just under 10 acres inside the fence. Um, and the fence encompasses just under 10 acres. So that's 0.23 megawatts of capacity per acre. Uh, if you use that same ratio for 66 megawatts, the the value that you've got there for Amherst fair share by land area for 2050, 66, that translates into about 290 acres needed um, of that sort of that sort of density of, of the solar panels. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And that's right in the between your two numbers there, the last two rows, the one. Yeah, we didn't really get to that, but that was you know that was uh, not so much looking at the solar capacity but the land use that Massachusetts was suggesting in our quote unquote fair share of that. Yeah. Now, the difference between the two numbers, which may accommodate, uh, uh, account for some of the difference is that some of that capacity uh, of the 66 uh, would be on rooftops and residential, yeah. uh, where, whereas the, the land, uh, the bottom two rows are strictly the ground mounted arrays um, expected in Massachusetts. That's true, but that 66,000 acres that you cited, that's in addition to maximizing rooftops in Massachusetts. Correct. Correct. That's, that's specifically, that's a value for ground out solar needed by 2050. Yeah. Yes. And if I can interject again, the, the total land area of Amherst looks to be about 17,000 acres, if I just Google that correctly. So again, <laughs> these are 1% or smaller sort of numbers, smaller than 1%. Right, which is, uh, did I do that right? Or maybe about 1%? Anyway, I got 2% when I calculated it. Sorry, yeah, you're probably right. I'm sorry, I'm thinking wrong. Um, so it's it's uh, not an enormous, yeah. not an enormous thing. Anyway, so worth keeping yeah. in mind. And uh, Sue has his hand up. Yeah, yeah so, so anyway, oh, oh, Sue, your audio is all messed up again. <coughs> So it happens like an hour and a half in. On yeah, it's the... always at the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. I don't know why it happens, but thanks, Dwayne, for doing this. So, uh, if we want to be self sufficient, are we saying in 2050, 166 megawatts is our need? I, I, and I think it's kind of the question that Jesse had as well. I'm kind of getting confused here. Um, the fair share by land area if from 2022 to 2050, that's a seven fold increase. Fair share by population 18 to 28, that's a seven fold increase. So shouldn't the sufficient solar installed to meet our needs in order to be fully self-sufficient be a seven fold increase? No, no, uh, because um, the first line there, our, our electricity is sufficient to meet our uh, electricity needs that's based on our electricity needs, the, the row above the 95,000 and the 190,000. Uh, okay. um, the other rows are based on, you know, current solar installed now in Massachusetts, which is not anything close to meeting the Commonwealth's needs. Um, and, um, and, and, um, and that the build out of solar is just, you know, need, needs to be built out about, uh, I think it's about six times more solar that we need um, between where we are now and, and 2050. Yeah, if I can add one more thing, remember the electricity needs were projected to double, which is what you're seeing in that first line. Yeah, 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 it's a doubling. Yeah, exactly. So the other things are not related to that. They're right. Yeah, 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 they're not related. Correct, so except on the, the previous slide, the 2022 solar capacity and 2050 solar capacity, that's, that's just the capacity. That's not a requirement, the load requirement. Is that what I'm reading? Slide That's five? correct. That's okay. just our, uh, right. based on solar capacity. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Stella has her hand up. Yeah, I was just thinking about how there's also there's also additional uncertainty in the acreage needs for 2050 because we can't necessarily anticipate like the technical advances in efficiency with respect to the, the panels themselves. With respect to Steve's point, right? Like 
there's some degree again. of uncertainty there. Oh, in terms of if, if panel efficiency goes up, um, yeah, then, we need then acreage increase. needs yeah, might right. potentially go down. Right? I, um, that being said, I I don't know whether EEA considered that in their um, roadmap report. Um, I, 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 I mean, it seems better to err on the side of more anyways, but there is like just additional uncertainty yeah. there, it seems like. And that's a, a good point that I think will come up in future conversations for the Solar Bylaw Committee. Uh, it could be that a bylaw in Amherst specifies a certain a ratio of megawatt production per acre as, as, a, um, as a standard. And that would mean that manufacturers or companies installing the solar farms would have to figure out ways to either use higher efficiency panels, which do exist, they're more expensive, uh, but you can pack more of them into a given area, or just to simply be a little bit more efficient in the way they pack in the rows of panels, um, or possibly use tracking panels. Tracking panels are being used more widely uh, in lower latitudes. You get a, a bigger benefit for tracking panels in um, areas in lower latitudes than in northern latitudes, especially with Massachusetts climate. But but that's an option. That it again, it adds cost, but it does allow you to produce more in a smaller amount of area. Yeah. So those are things yeah. that um, are on my list of recommendations to our ideas for the Solar Bylaw Committee to suggest as um, things to consider when they're drafting standards for solar farms in town. So I want to say that um, just taking the um, land area of Amherst and the land area of Massachusetts does not give us the correct um, capacity for siting solar. What we really want in our analysis is to know what's the capacity on roofs and disturbed land and what's that capacity statewide and so what's our fair share of that? And then take um, land that is, you know, potentially disturbable um, statewide and compare that to our disturbable, <laughs> that's a terrible word, um, land. It, it, otherwise, we don't have um, the right comparison to Boston, for instance, which has, you know, only rooftops and disturbed land, you know, or built environments. <coughs> so well, when I think we, we think want... about our fair share, we, we have to think about, you know, we we do enjoy the privilege of extra space. Um, not that we want to fill it with solar, but in terms of fair share, that's the calculation we need. Am I right? Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to overuse the word fair because there's so many different ways to um, slice that and maybe I should have um, yeah. Well, Not just in terms that. of land use, land yeah. area. Yeah. Um, well, I think we do want to um, work with the solar consultant to get a better handle on how much we, the t for the town of Amherst, we can't do this for the whole Commonwealth, but for the town of Amherst, how much can we reasonably assume we could um, accommodate on our rooftops and uh, previously disturbed lands uh, like the landfill and so forth, um, and and that's a fix. That'll be somewhat of a fixed number, um, and then and then we can say okay, uh, well, and that's going to you know, and recognizing that's going to cost more, uh, but probably we can make an argument that it's that it's worth it. But that's for others to sort of think about, um, or at least that it it's it'd be transparent. This is what we could accommodate on rooftop, but it's gonna cost us and the Commonwealth ratepayers more to do it this way. Um, 
and, and, and then see how much of these numbers that can accommodate that can can uh, uh, that, that can can be done in that way. Um, you know, I would say that we we you know we we have six megawatts. Was it already installed on uh, in um, seven megawatts installed residential, uh, which is you know, and, and you know we see a lot of solar in Amherst, uh, but there's a lot more a lot more homes that could have solar, uh, probably well more than twice or three times as much as already have solar. So we can probably get get to um, a couple tens of, of megawatts that way potentially. Um, uh, but it does come at a higher cost. Um, and so we don't want to leave that leave that un, unstated. Right. So um, I'd like to move on to our outreach and education yep. uh, topic. And um, are there any other next steps? I think the purpose of that presentation was for us to contribute ideas for the solar assessment, what information we want to have from it. Are there any other next steps? Well, let me just say, I, I do want to, uh, the next step is to do that, is, you know, what do we want to take from, from uh, this analysis and, and, um, and, and translate that into some uh, um, request to the solar, uh, the solar um, assessment consultants um, on, um, on what to, to look at. So um, um, maybe I can come back based on this conversation with some a, a straw proposal <clears throat> of what we might do um what we might um relate to the solar consultant um next time we meet um but stephanie has something to say about that i just want to clarify that this would be a recommendation to the town manager on what to include so it wouldn't be directly i just want to clarify that no absolutely absolutely that's, absolutely. That's, absolutely you're not talking directly to the consultant <laughs> you're making a recommendation to the town manager. Yeah. Th through the mechanism of the solar bylaw committee. The no. solar assessment is separate from the yeah. bylaw working group. That's the solar assessment is happening separately. So yeah. okay. they'll look at it. They'll, they'll get some of the information as they go along. I, the way I'm envisioning it is that information from the assessment will maybe some of this will help them and some of this information that Duane is bringing up is kind of relevant um but theirs is more a process for citing solar this is more the sort of some of this has to do with some of the more philosophical questions the town is asking mm -hmm. so okay a little bit different yeah and if, if I might just suggest, Dwayne, if, if you have the energy to develop a couple different scenarios, a high yeah. and a low yeah. estimate, yeah. and I'm happy to help you know, check numbers or share spreadsheets and um, confer with you yeah. on that. Okay, appreciate that. And I don't think they, we, it, this doesn't need to be precise. I mean, it doesn't, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, 50 or 53, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, it just needs to be a couple. And I like the idea of, you know, low, medium, high or something like that. Yeah. And I I commend the air quotes on fair share or the quote quotes rather, yeah. the fair share quotes. I think that does the job. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Let's right, um, thank you. turn to Vasu who's um, had an assignment from last meeting on uh, outreach and education. Did you get any feedback from any of us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so I did receive feedback from uh, Jesse, Steve yesterday and Lori today. So I didn't really get a lot of time to put this together, but um, I tried to consolidate the ideas and, and I'll go over it. So, um, so each slide is a potential idea for how we can improve outreach. So, um, and it's in sequential order in terms of, you know, what we want to do first. So first one is around carbon literacy. Um, and the way I've divided this is, well, how do we want to do it? What is going to be our approach? So is it going to be via Zoom or uh, a different mechanism that we can talk about? And, and is it going to be a series of, you know, conversations with the community? 
or a one time only. And then the second column is, you know, what resources do we need to use or uh, work with? Um, and then what topics do we need to cover? So um, on carbon literacy, uh, you know, I figured maybe an educational series delivered either through Zoom or use the library where they have events uh, to really start broadening understanding of complex climate terminology. Um, starting off with that and getting the community to understand the different complexities, different emitters. Um, and, you know, I figured maybe this is where we can use experts from colleges or local advocacy groups and our library and the Hitchcock Center for some support to cover topics that focus on top contributors in Amherst and low premium alternatives, um, maybe around transportation and buildings, you know, okay to, if if you have feedback on what needs to be covered, we can we can talk about that. But that was the first topic. Um, the second topic that I have is the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization plan. So, you know, they understand the complexities first, and then they get in, um, you know, further down to what the state is looking for and what their plan is. And again, an educational series uh, as well here. Uh, similar resources, I also wonder, I'm thinking out loud now, maybe get the um, state involved in some shape or form, have them come in and deliver a lecture uh, to the community. And then our topics will be around why do we need to decarbonize and how we will decarbonize. And then the next one is, is our town. So going through our CARP, uh, similar structure around the educational series. Uh, you know, resources, whether it's us or uh, using library resources in the Hitchcock Center. And the topics will be around, you know, what are our key initiatives and how can the community support in meeting our key initiatives. Um, also had a suggestion on public forums. So uh, maybe to continue to keep the community engaged, have a quarterly Zoom series um, and a revolving topic around um, you know, any topic that we think is important at the time. Uh, I have a, the next one is around the reduction toolkit. So, you know, Lori, you and I, Laura also mentioned how difficult was it to, you know, get heat pumps. So I was thinking whether it makes sense to publish a toolkit, a one document that has all the information that somebody would need, whether it's a, uh, residential property or a commercial property, they can find information on mass save, uh, heat pumps, EV, you have all the information in that toolkit and maybe we can publish that toolkit um, and it's out on the Amherst website uh, for people to look at. Just makes it easier, you know, step-by-step -step approach to get or to meet a certain objective for that person. Um, I have sustainability festival. So I'm meeting with Billy, who's the director at the Hitchcock Center next Tuesday. We're gonna talk about programs that uh, you know we might benefit as well. Uh, this is around planning for an event at the Commons. I know I've mentioned this before, but starting to use some of our resources, including the bid and our local businesses, and, and really start talking about, uh, you know, the carbon habit, um, you know, turn off electricity for half a day, for example, uh, during that festival, um, play movies at the Amherst Cinema uh, to engage the community, um, bring vendors in, have food stalls and bring the farmer's market will be some of the topics here during that festival. And then the, and then the next one is on volunteer drives. So different volunteer drives to engage the community um, and I talked last time about uh, the UMass alumni network that I belong to. Uh, we're going to try to have an event at the Hitchcock Center, but what other events that we can have uh, partnering with these different resources covering similar topics, including river cleanup and food co-op and, and farmer's market. And then uh, the next topic is around the greenhouse gas emissions dashboard. So creating some sort of a data display that uh, um, either is either posted on the website or on in the town hall, right in, in front of the building, solar powered, of course, 
Um, but but it's really starting for the, the community to see data um, and to look at what our current emissions are. What is the percent left to meet the goal? And maybe add other information that could help you know, pass or people passing by to see what they need to do and continue to engage them that way by showing them some data that can be displayed either on the website or, or physically somewhere. And then I put a timeline. Um, so again, walking through the process, right? So we start with the carbon literacy campaign, get them to understand the complex uh, complexities around, uh, you know, different types of uh, uh, you know, carbon emitters and how we can reduce them. And then uh, talk about the overarching state plan and then talk about um, our plan, but also work on the dashboard that we can publish um, and then have the toolkit before the sustainability festival. So we can talk about the toolkit and its availability during the festival and then continue having conversations during our public forums and then also, um, you know, this the frequency of volunteer drives could be whatever, but I just put in, um, you know, a quarter now uh, that we can have volunteer drives with uh, engaging different community community groups and support groups in the community. So that's all I had. Um, it's all the ideas that I received and I put in my own. Any comments or thoughts on this? Thank you so much, Vasu. It's really great to have it laid out. General I, comments? I do actually have a couple of things. Um, so first, Vasu, this is really great. Can you get me this slide presentation so I can include it in the packet? Yes. We'll um, so a couple of things. Um, Two things that you have listed here are, hap are going to happen. Um, one is that I requested funding through the ARPA funds for um, putting together a dashboard. So there is going to be funding for that <clears throat> happening. I don't know, the timing may not align exactly with what you have here, um, but there is funding for, um, I've had discussions with the communications director about doing just this. And the town could do sort of, I mean, we could do one early, but we can also work with um, a consulting firm that actually does exactly this specifically for greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, and that would be um, Kim Lundgren Associates. And they're the ones who have worked with a lot of municipalities on creating their dashboards, for instance, Concord, which I know Darcy is very fond of. So they, um, they, enlisted the help of KLA associates to get their dashboard. So anyway, that's one thing. The second thing is the sustainability festival happens already. Um, mm -hmm. It was on hiatus because of COVID, but it's already scheduled for next year for April 22nd, which, which is actually on Earth Day. Mm -hmm. So instead of creating a whole other festival, we have one, you are the community that works, that I work with and, um, you know, I think if we're going to do that, it should be around the existing festival. And there's yeah, that's what I was great. thinking, Stephanie. I, I completely yeah, agree. I didn't know what it was so, called. Yeah, 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 no, it's called the Sustainability Festival. So okay. it's and it's on April 22nd. So you're you're only a okay. week off, which is great. <laughs> so that's great. And I love the idea, as I think I told you before, you know, earlier on, we did have workshops. Participation was always a bit spotty. Um, you know, we did things like had events at the library or at town hall at the same time that the festival was going on. And it's tricky. You know, the weather always plays a role. It's really inconsistent. But I think where we are at this point in time, um, building things around it actually would probably work really well. Uh, sometimes it's hard to have them at the same time, but like having things like the night before, the day after, um, and depending what the thing is, you know, on the day of the event could work well. So I really love this and I'm excited about, you know, enhancing that event. Stephanie, is there resources here that I'm missing that I should connect with? No, I mean, we can talk offline about, about okay. this around the festival stuff. I'm, I'm happy to talk offline okay. because we've engaged, um, you know, the bid, the chamber, uh, maybe I don't see the chamber here. Um, but we've worked with the local chamber, we've worked with the universities um, and the colleges. 
have had some involvement over the years. And again, it, it waxes and wanes in terms of their participation, but mm. um, I would love to see more involvement. It's hard because especially that this is gonna occur on Earth Day next year, a lot of organizations and institutions will wanna do their own thing. But um, we did have a climate march one year uh, that was organized with the University of Massachusetts. And that was wonderful. Like at least 300 people showed up. And I had friends from um, Franklin County who actually showed up at our little local Amherst March that day from Kendrick Park to the Common. So if we could get something like that organized again, that would be great. Yeah, that was a moment in time. It was 2017 and it was the Science March. So it was, it was but already I think they planned for that. Right. Day. Uh, yes, well, yes. Um, but I think, you know, but we have a year with which to plan something. And I think it's, well, it's a time again. <laughs> you know, I think we're at a time again where lots, I, are ha lots of things are yeah. happening. And, and I think that um, the, the key is that there are already groups working on things. And, you know, we need to kind of build these native groups that already um, get together, talk, have um, their own sessions and pool those resources. So um, I, I, I like your approach, Vasu, for kind of, I think that will make it possible. Um, yeah, so how, do, I, I guess it's if, I mean, the first question is if everyone's okay with the sequence of activities, at least talking about you know, the literacy campaign and the uh, you know, state decarbonization plan and the CARP education. If we were to go do this first, what are the resources that I need to connect with? Um, and Andrew, I think you, you're more familiar with this than I am. I mean, do I have the right people and is, is the right forum? And we can have discussions with the resources to figure out what the right forum for that communication should look like. But are these the right people, or am I missing anybody? I mean, the the resources at the colleges and the university are vast. Um, so it would, and there's, you know, probably ten, fifteen advocacy groups that would be interested that are actively organizing. Um, Andrew, we have um, four members with their hands up. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. Um, so I'm just gonna go in order. I don't know who raised their hand first. So um, Steve. These, these are great. This is wonderful, Vasu. For additional local advocacy groups, there's the um, schools, the K-12 schools, the teachers, and then also the Amherst Sunrise group. Um, I know they are sponsoring an event at the Hitchcock Center this coming Saturday, I believe. Head um, 45 to 5.30, workshops yeah. all day long. And then on Sunday, one to three on the common rally and um, come and support our youth. So. I think, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. When I looked at their schedule, I was a little disappointed that I didn't see anything really in the carbon literacy, at least I, that I could tell by the titles, maybe, maybe it's in there. Um, is far for efficiency on some of these topics. I think it would be wonderful if we could create toolkits or packets or videos, something like TED Talk sort of things that groups could use at their own time and place so that we ourselves don't have to go out and do every single event. Um, so that could be a way to increase our, our leverage and our exposure. And one other resource or strategy could be through local newspapers. Uh, it could be that we write columns for, I think, was it the, the Daily Hampshire Gazette? Is it Earth Matters? They have an occasional column that's written by local folks about earth and environmental things. So it's, it's different than writing an editorial or a letter to the editor, um, but working with the reporters to help make sure they understand the carbon literacy and the climate act and the 2050 plan, make sure they have a good understanding of it. Then when they write other articles, they can make sure they can get that, you know, that, that information gets in there. 
And then the other source in terms of expertise is not necessarily people, but reports. And besides the Massachusetts 2050 report, there's four or five other similar reports that sort of dictate what we need to do in this country, um, both state level and national level to reach those sort of 2050 carbon neutrality goals. Um, there's the Academy of Sciences, US Academy of Sciences report. There's a Princeton University report. There's others. I can send those to you. Um, they're wonderful, if very dense um, sources of information, but very thorough. Thanks, Steve. Stella has her hand up. Oh, I was also just going to mention mention sunrise and the importance of kind of just really having having a youthful voice because I think there I think they're actually from I think there there is a lot of literacy um, in many ways and it's people often just like don't know what to do and are sad and mad um, and so. Like, I, I don't even know if I would call it literacy, although I do really appreciate like the timeline you've laid out because that then people are, if people are like, feel like, oh, like, but I'm literate, I'm just like really sad and mad, you know? Um, I think, but I, and I don't really have an, I don't really have an answer here, but I think like bringing the youth in and giving people like, like clear resources and clear community that's not like, recycle you know like drive less because everybody knows that you know um so i i think i think it's like really it's it's really good i just think that 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 maybe some of the framing um i would ask i would ask the teens <laughs> yeah and, and stella good points i think that's one of the reasons why i have this is this one will tell you what somebody needs to do, right, is you have information, whether you're installing solar at home or you're buying LED bulbs from Asse, right? I, I, I thought this might be a powerful tool that the community could use because it, we could capture the variety of information where the community could do something, could take an action um, based on the different resources that we have, but it's complex. Yeah, so maybe maybe those two things go together and it's instead of a like a carbon literacy event, it's like a community planning event where here's the toolkit and people can come and like plan together like what makes sense for them and kind of like talk, talk. Um, and maybe some of the, the college experts, for example, are positioned there to kind of help support people in kind of creating creating plans. So maybe more. instead of like two separate things in the timeline, those are like one. Yeah, except we don't have this ready yet, right, yet, right? And this is going to take time to build versus this, maybe it's just getting resources to help big topics, right? But yeah, I see what you're saying. And Lori has her hand up too. Um, yeah, I wanted to agree with the idea that uh, we should be focusing on, uh, you know, the, the, it's a block power said there are lots of people who want to make change and just don't know what to do and don't know how to get started and are frustrated and confused by it. And, and that's the folks we should be focusing on because those are the ones that are the low hanging fruit that are going to make the biggest difference the fastest. So I would love to be involved in putting together that toolkit. One other thing, though, but I can't help but mention, I think I mentioned this once before, or maybe somebody else did. We do have a website that talks a little bit about some of this stuff on Amherst Town website, but it's in a sort of ridiculous place. It's hard to find. And when you do find it, it's called Sustaining Amherst, which sounds like a capital campaign. I, I really needs a different name. Somebody please, <laughs> Stephanie, can we please change that to something with greenhouse gas reduction or clean energy Amherst or energy transition Amherst or something like that, that tells the user what, where, you know, if they're looking for this page, they're more likely to be able to find it because right now it's completely invisible. Um, I was really hoping that might be a start at any rate. 
Uh, also, I'd like to suggest that, you know, if we do figure out how to, how to bring this to the public, how to have talks on how to make this transition happen on maybe something even aimed at, at uh, uh, rental property owners who might want to do this and don't know where to start, that we do it, instead of doing it on the campuses, do it downtown, do it in the new performance space or in Amherst Theater or something, something like that, you know, where a, a more central downtown space, um, if we are gonna do talks or something along those lines, just a thought. Um, sometimes the colleges, I think, feel a little inaccessible to people who live here. Thanks, Lori. Anyone else? We're almost out of time. So um, I, I think that this is a, a great beginning. I love having a lot of space in the timeline for the, what's now called the literacy campaign, because I do think that what we really want to do is target different populations who have different kinds of questions and different kinds of actions that they could do um, in the context of, you know, reduce your transportation, you know, what, what's your next car going to be? Or, you know, could you get an electric scooter? It, it, very, very limited topics where the literacy happens. So um, we need to um, really take steps though. I, I think that um, buses carried this for a while and that it might be time for us to have a uh, working group that has posted meetings and to actually get this, you know, some concrete things um, planned. And you know, planning over the summer is a, a good way to do it, let it take time. Um, so maybe people could let Stephanie know if they're interested in being a part of that. Does that make sense to people? But then there's another question around, is this going to be another uh, open meeting thing where if we're trying yep. to- events, Yeah, um... it has to be an open meeting, yeah. But, but to get any work done, we really need to have a couple of these. Yeah. No. You know, un unless it's just people who want to consult with Vasu on it, but my experience is it, it, it's too hard to get. Maybe you want to put this on the next agenda for a little more discussion about how you want to do that, because you're running out of time now, and I don't think people yeah. are ready to make a decision. Yeah. So. yeah. So for the next agenda, um, Dwayne might have time to come back with um, some particular a list of things that he thinks come it came up in our discussion and um, that are in, implied in, in his presentation. Um, and yeah, the next step for actually focusing on our outreach and education, how and who, um, and what else is on the, on deck that we didn't have on the agenda this week that needs to come back. I guess I'd like to um, hear from Don um, and, you know, maybe, I don't know if it, did anybody want to also work on the outreach to the chamber, the bid on businesses? I think someone did. I'm interested in that. Um, I'm just not, without getting down and sitting in a room and talking with people, it's hard to know how to fit in. So that's what I'm struggling with right now is yeah. how to go about doing this yeah. and satisfy the open meeting law at the same time. So maybe that's that's a, a topic for next agenda as well. So we can give that some shape. What's the topic exactly then? How um, am I listing that? Reaching out to the business community, working with the business community. Business community outreach, got it. Or I'm actually more interested in, in getting landowners involved, um, rental unit. Developers. Developers, yeah. 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 
Okay, great. And you okay. have a member of the public, so you. Oh, okay. yes, sorry. Um, would our member of the public like to speak? You can just raise your hand electronically. Okay. Nope. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you very much, Andrea and Stephanie and everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Wow. Well, thanks, thanks everyone for your great work. And go Celtics. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs>